The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. After this, Jesus reveal, revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he re revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because it was a quantity of fish. The disciple who Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they are not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, fish laid out on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus had revealed to the disciple, was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to the Lord, said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. The gospel of our Lord. Please join me silently while I pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I just thank you for this day. It's a day that you have made and we will be glad in it. We are thankful for it. We thank you for bringing us safely through the night and protecting us from all harm and evil. Thank you for all the saints that are gathered here to hear your word. We just pray, Lord, that you will open ears to hear, open hearts to accept, and grant us your wisdom to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Pardon me, but I get a little dry when I talk, so... A week earlier, <clears throat> before this, Peter had seen his Lord arrested, and he had seen him after he was beaten. He saw him crucified, and he saw him, at, and he knew, didn't know at that time, as we know today, that Sunday was coming. He had denied his Lord three times, and I cannot imagine the guilt that he would have uh, felt, and it was just, I just can't imagine. But here he is, a week and a half later, and he's seen his Lord three times, he knows he's been forgiven, and this is basically his commissioning into ministry. 
wasn't going into going to the seminary. He was being commissioned with what he had taught and by the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he was soon to receive. And when, <clears throat> when I was reading through this passage, I was wondering, you, you can imagine modern day times, Peter said, oh, we're going fishing, or let's go fishing. You can imagine being at the lake, at a beach, or wherever. There'd be a, some tents, some trailers, some RVs, and uh, fire going. You can smell the smoke, maybe some coffee, and you can imagine it. But to uh, be with these, with the disciples, I, I was wondering how long a trip would this have been? The closest body of water was six miles away. That was the Dead Sea, and nothing in it. The next largest body of water was the Mediterranean. That's about 40 miles west through the mountains and this sort of thing. The Sea of Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee, was 70 miles away. So I wonder how much planning there was, you know, for these guys to get away from Jerusalem after this time. Just an FYI, but I, did, I was curious and I had to look that up. Um. The title for my sermon is, So What Are You Going to Do About It? It's something that kids in school might hear on the playground, the, the class bully gives them a shove and trips them up, knocks their books out of their hand, they're, hey, so what are you going to do about it? Just like they're enticing a fight. But I came up with the title from a movie that David shown at uh, Do You Believe? And in the scene, there is a fellow in the evening going down in a city street, pulling across something like this one, about the same size, with a wheel on the end. And he's reciting scripture as he goes along. Some people are giving him a funny look. But he's reciting scripture. Sometimes he would bless them. Sometimes he would give them a warning. Comes up to an intersection, and this car pulls up to a red light. The window's open, and he stops. And he says to him, do you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ? And the fellow in the car, his window's open, he says, well, I'm a pastor, I have to. <laughs> and without missing a beat, he says, so what are you going to do about it? That's my question to you. It's my question, a good question for me. You can almost picture Jesus asking you yourself, what are you going to do about it? As parents, as grandparents, aunts, uncles, business owners, business managers, yeah, whether you're talking to friends, talking to strangers, we all have a chance to do ministry. And that's, at our baptism, I mean, we are being prepared for our own ministry. As long as we have breath in our lungs and a clear mind, we are able to do ministry. Uh, before I went to St. Louis for the Stephen Leaders course, I went to a task one for the Good Sam Society, and there was a course there on hospital visitations and this sort of thing. And uh, the one instructor was a chaplain at the Edmonton General. And it's a ho there's a hospice there. And the average length of stay from uh, time that you were admitted, and this is the end of life, it is anywhere from three to 10 days. But this one fellow, this patient had been there for some time, and he went to this chaplain and he said, why hasn't Jesus taken me home yet? And this fellow said, you know, I'm not sure. What, uh, what do you do with your day? He said, well, get up in the morning and I have my time with the Lord. Have some breakfast when I've got my strength. I, I try and go and visit each one of the patients and I talk about Jesus, and if they're willing, I pray with them. Sometimes I get the chance to talk with their families. He said, you've just answered your own question. You are an instrument, and God is using you. He said, by the way, how long have you been here? Nine months. The Lord can use you at any stage of life. As a parent, I don't know, one of the things that I have to do I, is I have to teach my kids, you know, our home church. As grandparents, if your children are growing, growing and left, 
and your grandkids aren't going to church, I mean, there's, there's a ministry for you right there. Here's an acronym for Bible, B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me, a song. <laughs> but Bible, basic instruction before leaving earth. To the non-believer, we may be the only Bible that someone reads. And it's us by our actions that convey whether we're a Christian or not. In chapter 2, verse 17, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. And in verse 26 we read, For just as the body without a spirit is dead, so also is faith without good works. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's one of the first things with ministry. Always be ready to give an answer. And I'll get, give you a little bit of my testimony. Uh, before Cameron knew this, I, mean, I haven't really discussed this too much with the rest of our kids. But before I came to Camrose, I was married. That was a surprise to pastor one of our elders meeting. He was like, I never knew that. Married, divorced. I came home from work one night, or actually, oh, the reason I'm divorced, I found out that my ex was having an, an adulterous affair. But I came home from work one afternoon. My wife was on her way to work. She stopped in the doorway and she said, I think it's time you found yourself a new place to live permanently, and the sooner the better. And she had two children from a previous marriage, and they were arm's reach behind me. And she turned and walked away, the door closed. And these two kids each grabs me by the thigh, they were seven and five at the time. He said, if you go, we want to go with you. I tell you, that hurt. That hurt so much, I was, I contemplated taking my life by suicide. I knew what I was going to do. I made, decided my days off to go visit family one last time, and I went to see my oldest sister and brother, brother-in-law in Edmonton. And uh, it, it was ironic because someone in their church family had just committed suicide. And it was, my sister's telling me this, and I'm thinking, oh, little do you know. And then she proceeded to tell me how this grieved the family. And the pain is something that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I saw a saying yesterday on Facebook, it said, suicide does not get rid of pain, it just transfers it to someone else. And I thought that was so fitting for today. But I could not do that to my parents, because that's who, it, in this situation, it had hurt the most. But God had put other people into my life after this, and one was my fire chief, because I was on the fire department. And uh, he wouldn't let me quit. I had, was going to resign because the fellow that my wife had the affair with was on the same crew on the department. He said, I want you to make me a promise. He said, don't leave town for one year because you're just running, running away from your problems and they're going to follow you. Two, he said, I'm on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 for everyone in this town, and that includes you. If you ever need to talk, he says, I don't care what time of day it is, we can go for breakfast at the Husky truck stop, and he says, you can talk and I'll listen. We can talk about anything. He says, but I'm there for you. And I'm so thankful for that, and I've never been able to repair that or repay that. I've been able to uh, offer that to others, uh, people that I've met that have been going through a similar situation. Another time that God's impacted my life and given me hope, when I was moved back to Camrose after uh, I was working at Home Hardware, and uh, working the night shift. I normally carpooled. I was coming home, coming through the junction. It's about 7.25, late spring, early summer. Beautiful day. And uh, a lot of traffic that morning. 
but I was alone coming through the junction and from the south comes a loaded gravel truck hauling a loaded pup, to dual axle pup. And witnesses said that it looked like the gravel truck driver was trying to get ahead of me. And I'm barely through the intersection and the tire from the front axle of the pup comes up over my hood right where the, the post from the windshield meets the hood of my vehicle and the rear axle goes down square over the front headlight and the passenger side. Remember the Dukes of Hazzard TV show when they used to drive their cars like that? From the rotation of the tire, it flipped me up and I can't remember the measurement from the point where this tire came down and kind of crunched my vehicle and you could see that imprint and then where it came down. I couldn't steer, the wheel was actually broken off the axle, there was two cables holding it to the car still. And by the grace of God, his hand or his angels, I couldn't steer, they pushed me over to the side of the road. Uninjured. We, Cameron, our oldest, she was five, Spencer was four, Ryan was two, and Jackie was four or five months pregnant with Evan. She could have been a widow with four children. But that wasn't God's plan. And the other quick one, when I was working at Home Hardware, there was a fellow who used to work at Bethany, and we became good friends. He was a Christian, a very strong Christian. And we used to talk about the Bible while we were working in it, passed time really quick. And he was almost, be, became a mentor to me. But he said, uh, he invited to me, he said, My, our church is having a, a men's retreat. We, I'd like you to come. And he said, and it was two or three hundred dollars, but Jackie was on maternity leave with, from having Spencer, Cameron is just over a year old. So we had that diminished pay. I had just started at Home Hardware a few months earlier. Jack and I talked about it and said, you know, I really can't afford it. He says, don't worry about it. He came back to me a few days later and said, you know, I've talked to some people in my church and they sponsored you to go. And I, I was very blessed to go. And I'm very thankful that I went. For a Lutheran boy going to this event, this was a Pentecostal event. So when the preaching was going on, there was an amen over here and a hallelujah over there. Lively music like I had never heard in church before. And the songs were playing and there, sometimes there's a hand up, sometimes there's two hands up and same in the prayer. And it was wonderful. But the Holy Spirit touched me that Friday night. This was a two and a half day event, started the Friday, ended Sunday. And after the end of the Friday evening, it was about 10 o'clock, I had to get out of there. And I went out in the parking lot and I was, the snow was coming down. This is Halloween weekend, but it was starting to snow. The snow was coming down a little bit and I was talking to the Lord. And he had to listen, but I think his spirit talked to me. But it totally changed my life. When I came home, Jackie said I was different. And I had known Joe for years, and he said, I was, he even noticed that I was different. That's how I explain the hope of Christ to me. As parents, I think we need to get back to the basics. I mean, kids in school get nothing of the Bible in the public se sector public universities, it's a book of fairy tales or this sort of thing. But it's absolute truth. If you take anything out of it, it's no longer the truth. If you add anything, it's no longer truth, it's not pure. Uh, there was a, uh, a group in town a number of years ago from a church and they had a submitted an article to the booster, and it was, uh, they talked about what parts of the Bible are no longer relevant. And there was such an influx of letters to the editor that week that uh, they would not print any of them, and they came up with a rebuttal that we don't think this is the platform for uh, this sort of a topic. And I'm thinking, 
I have a platform today. The, uh, the Bible warns in 2 Timothy, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away and li from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. When people take away from the Bible or add to it, I mean, they're breaking the first commandment. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. They are a piece of this and a piece of that, and they're making their own God. One that's non-judging, non and there's no conviction by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 111 says in verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. In 2 Timothy, we read, all scripture is God breathed, or all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and for training in righteousness. If they had just opened their Bibles, they would know what they were doing was wrong. Matthew 10, 28, do not be afraid of those that can kill the body and not kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy, destroy both soul and the body in hell. Revelation 22, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add that to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away words from this book of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. They become like the proverbial corner used car salesman that gives you the fluff about a vehicle, but there's, they leave out all the facts. So what are you going to do about it? Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. These are the plans, these are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. What are your plans, what are your desires as far as ministry goes? If you don't know, you don't know what your gifts are, there's another spiritual gifts course coming up and I'm sure that between Suzanne and Leanne, they'll be contacting you if you haven't taken it and I encourage you to do so. The, uh, we have to start small, we don't have a large bunch of people here, but I know that we have to start doing ministry. We have to minister to young people, to the college students, to families, because people will come in this door and they'll ask, they'll come to the service and they, what do you have for families? And we can, nothing right now. We have to have it there when they're here so that they will return. We have to do a, start doing some men's ministry. And Joe had talked about this last Sunday that he had some ideas and I had some ideas of the, we just have to get it going. As men, we are called to be the spiritual leaders of our families. When there's not uh, a father figure in the home, there's all sorts of stats about things that happen. 23% of kids in elementary school come from broken homes. I was shocked to hear that. They're 20 times more likely to have behavioral issues, five times as likely to commit suicide, 67 times more likely to be arrested between the ages of nine and 12, nine times likely to drop out of high school, seven times as likely to end up in jail, and of all the people in jail, men and women included, 85% come from broken homes. Fathers are the key to, the, to families, to keeping them together. When it's broken homes, moms have a tough time playing mom and dad, and they have to step up to do that job as well, and it is very tough. The, one of the things I was going to mention as far as our children is, uh, I mean, the Bible is a book of instruction 
everything is real. And it, the Bible gives us uh, instruction in everything, whether we're talking about relationships, whether we're talking about how we deal with situations. Uh, the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. First commandment with a promise, uh, you will ha if you honor your parents and obey them, you'll have a long life. And it goes for your people in business as well, or you have to respect the elders and those in charge of you. And you see, when you go to the store, you can hear families, and they don't get along, they're unchurched, it's just kind of, thank you, Jesus, for the family I've got. I got a little mixed up there, but that's okay. Uh, so what are you going to do about it? I hope that you guys have got some ideas for ministry. I hope your ears have been opened. And we need to go, I hope you know it, we need to go forward to grow this church. And it will grow. There was a story of about a pastor who was, had, was given the uh, idea to start a new church, to build a church. And they started on their way. They had kind of had ideas drawn up. And something happened with the church. There's people saying no, yes and no, and no, we can't afford this and this sort of thing. If it's God's plan to do something, to grow something, it will get done with or without us. It might be the person across the aisle that has the idea that you don't think will ha it will happen, or it might be someone at another church. But this pastor in this situation, he uh, ended up falling out of the ministry and moved away, came back a few years later. And the spot, the land that was going to be used, there was a church. And he went in one Sunday, and he was sitting at the back, and he skipped out right after service. Someone had seen him, but they, and they wanted to talk to him, but they couldn't. He came back the week later, and someone caught him before he got out the door, welcomed him, and uh, asked him who, who he was. And he said, well, I used to be a pastor. He said, this was supposed to be my church. He said, your church. He said, our church had plans to build this church, and he took out a piece of paper, unfolded it, and it was the exact drawing, the exact layout of that church. God's plans will succeed, just like the Bible is 100% true. It's either history or it's prophecy. If it hasn't come true yet, it's going to, there's no part. I just challenge you, think of ideas that we can do for ministry so that we can step up just like Peter did and take our place. I'd like to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for the saints that are here. I thank you for that ears have been opened. I thank you for the ideas that you're going to bring together for us as a church and how we're going to grow in the future. I just pray your blessing upon those plans and that they will come to fruition soon. In Jesus' name, amen.